Hey everybody, welcome to Tutor Terrific. Today I'm going to look at um, forces again. Uh, this is our second video in the Unit 4 of uh, my physics course series, and we are going to look at Newton's second and third laws today. In the last video, just a reminder, Newton's first law uh, discusses inertia and how um, a mass, well, it, it's called the law of inertia. It discusses the background on inertia saying that uh, an object will maintain its current state of motion unless or rest unless a net force acts upon it. So we're building off of that today and looking at his second and third laws. So to prepare for his second law of motion, I really need to define mass. Mass is really the measure of the inertia of an object in physics. So how much an object has resistance to acceleration is a measure of its mass. So it's, you've got to understand, a lot of people mix this up. They think mass and weight are the same thing, and they're not. Weight is different than mass because weight depends on the gravity of nearby objects, and mass does not. So things weigh different on the moon than they do on the Earth, but they have the same mass. Just look at the lunar landing videos, you'll see what I mean. So the mass of this football um, is decent. I mean, it's more than zero. But uh, I can pretty easily, with the a contact force between my foot and the football, get it to accelerate quite rapidly. Uh, try applying a force to Jupiter and getting it to move. Um, good luck. It's got way more mass than the football, and so it's going to be much harder to cause uh, any noticeable acceleration to it. So that's mass. Now this directly prepares you for Newton's second law. Okay, Newton's second law has to do with this idea of mass and acceleration and the force that would cause an acceleration in particular. So let's look at uh, this uh, paraphrase of what he said. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force on the object and inversely proportional to its mass. Okay? Again, direct proportion between acceleration and net force and an inverse proportion between acceleration and mass exists in the universe. This is Newton's most famous law and it's commonly written like this, F equals MA, okay, F equals MA. If you get A alone, you will see that A equals F over M, so a direct proportion exists between A and F, and an inverse proportion exists between A and M. Now often, uh, sometimes we don't like to say F net external, meaning external net forces, Ex internal forces are completely ignored here, um, we sometimes use this instead, sum of F. Now, sum of F makes a lot of sense because we have multiple forces acting on an object. These are all vectors, and they all add to give one net vector. So, F net. Now, force. Okay, I'm defining force for the first time. A force uh, is measured in newtons, okay? This is the quantitative measure uh, of a force. And uh, we use the unit Newton after Isaac Newton. A very fitting unit name, for sure. Now, let's talk about this relationship. So let's say we, 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 we have a certain force. The, the amount of the force is constant. Let's say it's uh, exerted by a, a golfer uh, on his putting, uh, his putter. Uh, he exerts it first on a golf ball. Well, the golf ball is a very small mass. So it's going to, during the force's execution, we'll have a very large acceleration. And I know it's not very long, it's very instant in time almost, but that uh, is a lot because the acceleration of the golf ball is quite large during that time to go from zero to maybe one or two meters per second. Now, say he applies that same force with his putter to the truck, okay? This truck has a huge mass, and so the acceleration must be extremely small in order for this product to be equal to the original product F, okay? MA, 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 they are inversely proportional, okay? All right, now let's practice using this law with a simple calculation. We're gonna do an estimation here. We're gonna estimate the nest force needed to accelerate something that weighs 1,000 kilograms, a car, at 1 half G, or, um, well, also, we're going to see the acceleration, uh, the net force needed to accelerate a 200 gram apple at the same rate. So it's a basic size apple. So part A, we've got the 1,000 kilogram car. We've got the acceleration as well. So we have the M and the A. 
But one half g, what does that mean? Well, g is um, 9.8 meters per second squared, as we defined in previous chapters. So we have one half of that. Let's go ahead and find what that is. One half of 9.8 meters per second squared is approximately, since we're estimating, 5 meters per second squared. Remember, in estimating, we use one sig fig as a good ballpark. Okay, so now if we uh, take that acceleration in the proper units and multiply it by 1,000, we will get 5,000 per force newtons. Okay, that's a lot of newtons. Okay, uh, as you would properly expect, the car's engine is capable of doing that. You, my friend, pushing behind the car or not. All right, part B, we're going to apply the same force. Excuse me, we're going to apply the same acceleration to a much smaller mass, 200 grams. Okay, 200 grams. These are the wrong units for mass. We need to convert that to kilograms. Just divide by 1,000 to go from grams to kilograms. So now we're at 0 0.200 kilograms. Now we can multiply that by the 5 meters per second squared. Same acceleration as before. And you get 1 newton. This is 5,000 times less than the car for the same acceleration. So the force and mass are directly proportional. This is what this is showing you. Larger mass, larger force. Smaller mass, smaller force, uh, if we keep the acceleration the same. Uh, another problem, a little bit more tricky. So let's say we need to find the average net force required to bring a 1,500 kilogram car, even heavier, to rest from a speed of 100 kilometers an hour with a distance of 55 meters. So in 55 meters, we're going from 100 kilometers an hour to zero. We're going to find the force required to do that. Well, in order to find the force required to do that, we're going to need to find the acceleration. And um, I don't just have the acceleration in my given information, so I'm going to have to use kinematics. <laughs> okay? And during that time, I've got this 100 kilometers an hour velocity. That is not SI units. I need to convert that first. So I'm going to show you that here, 100 kilometers per hour. Um, convert the uh, kilometers to meters by multiplying by 1,000 over 1. Cancel the kilometer units. Then the hours, I'm going to multiply by 1 over 3,600 to get rid of hours and convert to seconds because 1 hour is 3,600 seconds. And um, when I do that, 100 times 1,000 divided by 3,600, I get 28. So that's the initial velocity of the car. The final velocity is zero, and I have the change in position, the displacement, 55 meters. Which of the kinematic equations do I have to use? The time-independent one, okay? The time-independent one will be required here. So that is the roadmap for this particular problem. We have to use the time-independent equation. Now. Uh, solving for the acceleration would require subtracting v naught squared and then dividing by 2 times x minus x naught. Then a is alone. The final velocity is 0, and the initial velocity is 28 meters per second, so we'll go 0 squared minus 28 squared over 2 times the difference in, displace, uh, difference in position, so 55 meters. That's final minus initial. 55 meters. And uh, this comes out to negative 7.1 7 .1 meters per second squared. What? Why is it negative? Why did I not just look at the magnitude? Well, it's because velocity and acceleration point in opposite directions. And by default, I chose my velocity vector to be in the positive direction. Acceleration, as we saw in a previous lesson in Chapter 3, if it points backwards, uh, excuse me, Chapter 2, <laughs> if it points backwards from velocity, then that means it's negative if we choose the direction of velocity as positive. So that's why I'm keeping the negative here. So it means a negative force will result when I use f, uh, sum of f equals ma. So I've got the mass, and now I have the acceleration, which is negative. When I multiply those two together, I get negative 1.1 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Remember, force is unit. Newtons, whenever you've got kilometer, excuse me, kilograms times meters per second squared, that is newtons, okay, for force. So it's a negative force since it also points backwards from the velocity. Okay, if you haven't already seen that the direction of the net force uh, is the same as the direction of the movement, okay? What I mean by movement 
is acceleration. So the direction of the net force will be equal to the direction of the acceleration that the object undergoes. Okay, a little bit more particular information. Uh, look at this box, okay? It's on a table. There's lots of forces on it. There's a gravity force downward. There's this upward force counteracting gravity that I've kind of talked about through the Veritasium video, normal force. Uh, friction, which I haven't talked about much at all except to first define for you. That points backwards, and I'm pushing, so FP, forwards with this red vector. As you can tell, the net force will be to the right. The normal force and the gravitational force cancel when something's resting on a surface. So those two cross out. The friction force is substantial, but it's way less than the push force or the force applied. So the net force points to the right, so the acceleration will also point to the right. <clears throat> this is how it works. Net force direction equals the acceleration vector's direction. Okay, so that's Newton's second law. Now let's look at Newton's third law. I want to prep you with asking you if you've ever heard the following statement before. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, many of you have. Well, guess what? That was coined by a very important person to us. Isaac Newton, okay? Same Newton as the one I've been talking about with his laws of motion. But that's not the formal definition of his third law although it's quite related. His third law reads like this. As one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object will exert an equal but opposite force on the first object. Okay, wait, that's a mouthful. So we've got two objects. One object will exert a force on the other. If that happens, then the other will exert the same force in the opposite direction on the first. Interesting. So it is like a reaction and an equal but opposite reaction is occurring, but this just gets a little more into it. Notice how the forces emanate from different objects and act on different objects. I'll try and visualize that for you. First, I want to show you this. The um, mathematical equivalent of this statement with the double subscripts. So we've got a force by object 1 on object 2. If you look down here, this is how the subscripts are read. FAB means force exerted by A on B. So the agent is listed first, and the recipient is listed second. So this is a force by object 1 on object 2 will be equal to and opposite the force by object 2 on object 1. So these forces, vector-wise, would point in opposite directions and have the same length. Okay, here's an example. This person is pushing on this brick wall, okay? These are a Newton's third law pair of forces, okay? They are the forces that are uh, guaranteed by his law. If one happens, the other will happen. So this first one I can label, based on my previous slide's uh, nomenclature, we are going to say that this person, this 100 Newton force to the right, will be this force of the person... So this is by the person on the wall. So person first, wall second. P first, W second in the name. What about this force that the wall exerts on the person? Yes, the person feels that at their hands. Well, that would be the force by the wall on the person. So F, W, P. So this is an example of a Newton's third law pair. You can always tell it's a Newton's third law pair when the subscripts, the double subscripts, are switched as far as their order. Okay, here's another one. We've got a force. Uh, the hammer exerts on the nail, which is this right pointing vector, and there's the force that the nail exerts on the hammer. Now you might not have thought that existed because the, the nail seems to uh, <laughs> lose the battle, but uh, he still exerts that force. You feel it every time you contact your hammer with the nail, so it makes it hard to push the nail in. I'm going to talk about why uh, something moves like this nail in another slide. But let's name these forces. So this force here, the second force I named, that's the force by the nail on the hammer. Okay, And this is the force by the hammer on the nail. So FNH, FHN. That's a Newton's third law pair too. 
Can you name the third law pair forces in this example? So this balloon has been blown up. It's put on this rack, and it's allowed to slide along the rack. And then uh, the, the knot at the end is cut. So the air pressure inside, which is high, um, escapes, and that ends up propelling the balloon forward. So what are the two forces? Well, there's a force by the balloon on the air. Now that's often uh, misunderstood, but that's true. The balloon has to be pushing on the air, a net outwards push. And the, the pressurized air inside the balloon, well, it's going to push the balloon forward. So this is the force of the air on the balloon. Okay? Now, if you might think, you might be thinking, well, okay, these forces are equal and opposite, so they should cancel, right? If we added forces to vector, together because they're vectors and they're anti-parallel so they point in opposite directions and they have equal magnitude they should cancel right well yes if they acted on the same object so you might be thinking how can I get anything to move well first you have to understand that you have to understand that the Newton's third law pair forces always act on different objects not the same objects so they do not cancel when you look at particular objects okay so this man pushes on the fridge, the force forward, so this would be F, P, F, so force of per, by person on fridge, and the fridge will push back on the dude. So it'll be the force uh, by the fridge on the person. So you think, well, those will cancel and nothing moves. Well, not really, because you're supposed to look at one object at a time to determine net force, not all the forces in a situation. Okay? You've got to remember that. So, let me explain how you can get this stupid fridge to move because I'm sure you've moved a fridge or caused a fridge to slide in your life. So we need to look at all the forces acting on the man and the fridge in order to understand this. Okay, first you're going to draw a man and a fridge and then you're going to draw all, not just the ones you care about, but all the forces acting on the man then all the forces acting on the fridge. Don't worry, we'll get a lot more practice with this. Um, there are actually four forces acting on the man, okay, stick figure man here. Downward we've got gravity pointing down. Uh, upwards we do have that force that counteracts gravity, that normal force. Um, <clears throat> now if he's pushing on the fridge, then the fridge push backs on him. So F uh, by fridge on man exists to the left. Now why doesn't the man just fly, <laughs> why doesn't the man fly backwards then? Well. He's got shoes, or he doesn't, and he's sliding, but let's pretend he has some nice shoes on the ground, his contact, and they keep him uh, steady at one spot. Well, that's a type of friction force, and that has to point uh, to the right. So the man's not really going anywhere, okay, because all these forces in pairs cancel each other out. But the fridge, maybe not so. So first of all, the fridge has a gravitational force downward and a normal force upwards. And those two cancel. The fridge also exerts an equal but opposite force on the man. So the man exerts an equal but opposite force on the fridge. This force that points to the right, FMF, stands for the force by the man on the fridge. It's the equal and opposite force do, uh, that's um, on the, by the fridge, excuse me, on the man back here that points to the left. So those are Newton's third law pair forces. But the fridge fights back with friction, which we talked about earlier, due to the uneven uh, paved surface, or the uneven surface between contacts. So the fridge will uh, have experience of friction force, uh, but the um, man may overcome that. Let me explain. So let's look at uh, the forces that cancel try and simplify the situation so on the man we talked about the normal force and gravity canceling that's fine on the fridge we talked about those same forces canceling and now we're going to identify the third law pair forces that would be FFM and FMF man fridge fridge man so those are the third law pair forces then we have friction okay we're going to talk a little bit more about friction but friction cannot just be any value. Friction actually has limitations on what values it can be. The force by the man on the fridge can actually overcome 
friction. Okay, it can be greater than friction, thus causing an imbalance that we need to look for forwards to the right. And so the fridge can actually start accelerating to the right if the man with FMF can overcome through exerting that force friction. All right. So the net force on the fridge would be to the right because. The force by the man on the fridge is greater than the friction. It's actually called static friction. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, between the fridge uh, legs, the little pegs that the fridge has on the ground. So he's overcome that, caused the net force forward. Thus, the fridge will move forward. All right, guys, that's enough of those diagrams. We'll definitely look at more of those next time. They have a special name and a huge significance when it comes to more math in this unit. Uh, but for now, thanks for watching so much, guys. This is Falconator, signing out.